equity mates. From our mates at Spaceship. Investing made easy. Welcome to another episode of Equity Mates. We're excited to be here as always. My name is Bryce, and as always, I'm joined by my equity buddy, Ren. How is it going? I'm very good, Bryce. <laughs> uh, looking forward to this interview that we've got in store today. Absolutely. Uh, should, be, should be a very good one. So it is our absolute pleasure to welcome Julian McCormack from Platinum Asset Management to Equity Mates today to discuss uh, potential asset bubbles. Julian, welcome. Thank you so much. So Julian is an investment specialist at Placet Platinum Asset Management, as we mentioned, and today we're going to be discussing the question, are growth assets in a bubble? Now, Julian, Platinum has a view that growth assets are approaching or may even already be in bubble territory. So what are some of the key data points that have led to this sort of conclusion? Yeah, sure. So just on valuation, um, we're at about the 100th percentile in history, in human history, in the valuation of equities. Um, and I'm really referring to the MSCI All Country World and the S&P um, and, and actually all of the US indices taken together. So when we look at that, we're at about 205% market cap to GDP. We're at about 22, 23 times earnings looking a year forward. Uh, we're at about 38 times a 10 year average PE, five times price to book, a um, couple of times sales. Um, what does all that mean? That means we've never been here before, or if we have, it's vanishingly brief that we've been at this level of valuation before all of those metrics were of US equity markets. Um, that is way higher than 1929. And it's, it's comparable, it's about the same level, some above, some below, as in, as in the year 2000. And on that point of the year two, 2000, we often hear parallels drawn to uh, that time, given that this is very much a tech-focused bull run that we're living through. I mean, a key difference between now and then, though, is that in this bull run, some of these technology companies are not just profitable, but they're insanely profitable. So how do you think about that, uh, I guess, that parallel between the tech boom of the 2000s and today? Do you think it's a useful parallel um, in, in analysing today's market? I think, I think there's some validity in that view, but I just want to condition it a little bit because I think people forget and, and fit a narrative to suit their ends because the actual leaders of the market move in the late 90s were spectacular businesses. So Oracle, Dell, Juniper Systems, EMC, Microsoft, now Amazon to agree, it was small. Um, and remember, it was a TMT bubble. So it was tech, media and telco. So enormous sectors went to the moon. Just look at a chart of Telstra. So um, my... It, the margins are higher this time for the, for the better businesses, but outside of that slight dif difference, it's, it's a very similar phenomenon. So Julian, um, we've been, you know, a lot, a lot of people could argue that this time might be different, central bank policies, uh, you know, low interest rates, the environment may be somewhat what different. Um, what are some of the catalysts that you see that might burst the bubble and, and what is the time frame that you're thinking about when it comes to assessing this potential bubble that we might be in? It's, it's a fabulous question because, um, and thank you for bringing up interest rates because I should, have, I should have actually mentioned in my earlier commentary around valuation that the one thing people can derive comfort from is if you look at equities versus the yield on bonds, and the best way to do that is to invert the PE, and get an earnings yield, and then compare that to what bonds are giving you, say the US 10 year, then we're about middle of the road. We're sort of about 40th percentile, right? So what's a vulnerability there? Well, you'd better hope rates don't go up. So let's just broaden that response out. 
if you think about what can end um, market cycles, um, some sort of payment system instability, so 2007, 8 and 29 were banking crises, um, uh, some form of geopolitical uh, event. Um, but, but what we've forgotten is you can just have a bear market, right? So 2000 to 2003 was a 50% bear market in, in most equity markets. It was in the you know, global benchmark that we look at in Australia, the, the MSCI All Country World in Aussies. It was over 50% down. There was no, well, there was a political crisis in, around September 11, but that wasn't a huge, you know, precipitator of that. That was because we started off at a stupid level and we ended up at a more sensible level. We didn't have an economic crisis, but a very mild global recession. So, you know, the interesting thing about this stuff is we've all been living through, you know, 14 years of crisis. We've forgotten you can just have a bear market. So let me give you an example of the kind of thing I mean. Um, the US equity market was basically capped. You know, you, the, the Dow never got meaningfully above 1,000 points for 15 years from 67 to 82. It didn't feel like it at the time because you were up and down and up and down and up and down. But you just you had to grow into your multiple. And why? Because a whole bunch of spectacular businesses back then it was called the Nifty 50, got bid to the moon. And just finally on catalysts, I've got no idea what the catalyst would be, no one does, but also there doesn't really have to be one. There wasn't a real catalyst in 2000 and there wasn't a real catalyst, as I understand it, not having been there, in 29. You, you, you know, just swarm of midges type behaviour, you, you can just, the, the party can just end pretty quick. Mm -hmm. It's a, it's a good reminder, albeit a sobering one, but uh, I think it's important for us to keep in mind, you know, having really only invested in good times, that um, there doesn't need to be a, a crisis per se for it all to turn around. Now, Julian, we've mentioned uh, 2000, 2001 a lot, and a, a big thing that came after that was the resurgence of value um, investing and, you know, value outperformed growth for a little while after that. In Bryce and my investing lifetime, we've only ever seen growth outperform value. Do you think if uh, we do enter a bear market or there is some catalyst in this bubble burst, we might see value finally outperform growth for the first time in a little while? Yes, you'd think so. So, so normally the end of a market cycle sees the leadership of the market change. So, you know, back in that late 90s, into the early 2000s, what happened? You had the tech, uh, that, that whole TMT bubble collapse, but then you had a whole bunch of other sectors that had been very unloved begin to take up the mantle. And the thing is, this value versus growth thing, I, really what we're saying or what we're abstracting away from there is that humans are pack animals. You know, we, we, we work together. And we form um, trends and manias. We can't avoid doing that. And it doesn't matter if it's an algorithm doing it or a person doing it. The behavior is pretty similar. And so what will happen is in, in events like in the late 90s, stuff gets left behind. And that's the stuff that can actually make you money generally coming back out of a cycle. So you'd probably expect things that are a bit unloved, things that um, are probably a bit cyclical, have a bit heavier uh, capital requirement for the business and, and require higher pricing or a, a tight market to get pricing power, um, you'd expect that kind of stuff to do a bit better in um, any kind of unwind of, of the environment we've got now. And, and that would be precipitated by uh, somewhat higher inflation, somewhat higher nominal growth and somewhat higher interest rates going forward. That's, that's one possible path forward. So, so Julian, as Alex said, a lot of um, the equity mates community have never experienced a bear market. Some only have just experienced their first crash um, with the what happened in March last year. And you mentioned that there are a couple of catalysts that could lead to this 
uh, potential burst of a bubble, but the unknown is when that is going to occur. With everything at such high levels though, how do you suggest or what, how are Platinum thinking about investing at a time like this? Because it's easy to get carried away with these headlines for people that uh, have just started their journey, but they're also equally eager to start investing. So how would you approach a time like this? It's a very good question and I'll make a couple of introductory comments and then answer your very good question. A um, couple of comments around it is what we must remember is we've had huge waves of technological innovation previously and we've had massively important um, uh, markets open and, and change going on in the global economy. And when we get excited about that, we tend to, we tend to lose money. You know, people tend to lose money. So I'm um, going all the way back to the South Sea bubble, you know, the the um, rolling manias for railways all the way through the 19th century, um, the, the tech-driven bubble of the 20s, which was around radio and autos and, and all sort of new technology stuff. Those technologies were hugely impactful for the next 120 years, but they were terrible investments because you paid the wrong price. So that that's just by way of introduction to say, look, it might be that the specific technology you're looking at today is new, but hey, there ain't nothing new under the sun really, because human behavior doesn't really change. If you're paying, paying the wrong price for it, that's the problem. So that just sets the scene. Coming, stepping back from that, what we're trying to do is find businesses that are, you know, their inherent value is not being recognized by markets and we can see why. So that generally implies a bit of discomfort because if everybody knew it was great, it would be in the price. So that forces us to look a bit further afield than probably most investors do. So lots of money in um, emerging markets, so to speak. So China, South Korea, a little bit of money in India, it's a bit expensive, um, quite a bit of money in Europe. We have lots of money in the States too, but just nowhere near as much as other people. Um, so we'd have 25% of our money there. Most of our peers would have 60 to 80% of their money there. And that's really interesting, right? Because if people are really you know, excited about the future, do they actually think the future is the developed West? Do they actually think the future is people who look like me? It's not. The future's in Asia. Right, like you've got population growth, capital formation, a huge, the, the world's largest middle class is forming. And that's where you're going to make money for the next 100 years. It's not of, you know, old white duffers like me. So um, that, that's sort of a geographical sort of answer to it. But then there's this corollary to that, which is we must not forget that life works in cycles. And so when interest rates are at their lowest in 5,000 years, do you reckon rates go up or down? You know, just probabilistically. Try not to have a guess about where they are next year, but just think about directionally where will they go over time. And also, just please don't forget that um, the tech stock equivalent 15 years ago was a mining stock. Right? So... That mining boom is gone now, we've all forgotten. But that corollary, that, that analog of the, of the tech stock that people love today, 15 years ago, that was an iron ore miner or a, you know, a, a, a coal miner or, or something you know, pretty prosaic like that. So these things do work in cycles. Mm. Fascinating time to be investing, I think. But um, unfortunately, Julian, we have run out of time uh, we would have loved to have spoken about a couple of specific stocks, but I think that would be best left for getting you onto Equity Mates, the podcast, at some point, and we can discuss this in more detail because it is truly fascinating, and I know a lot of our community members um, would benefit from hearing more about this. So appreciate your time um, today, and we look forward to catching up soon. Thank you so much for the invite. Really appreciate it. And that uh, brings us to the end of another episode. Um, if you took a lot of value out of that, then you can also check out what we're doing at equitymates.com. Uh, you can contact us at, uh, you can contact us at contact at equitymates.com. 
But Ren, tomorrow we have more content. That's right. <laughs> we've got Watchlist Wednesday. We've got Owen Raskovich from Rask Invest joining us. So that's one you're not going to want to miss. So join us same time, same place. Uh, we'll see you all then. Equity Mates, from our mates at Spaceship. Investing made easy.